Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us here and for the wonderful conversation and great little nuggets of information and advice. With that being said, as mentioned, we're going to be welcoming Caleb Sai up onto the stage. Um, I've been very fortunate in my career to have heard and seen the stories of many young people who are dedicated to making a difference in their communities locally, in their communities globally. When I've heard other older people say they're worried about the future and our youth, I tell them that I'm not worried at all. I think these next generations are more passionate, more engaged, and more involved than we ever have been before. So with that being said, I know that Caleb's name has been mentioned quite a few times, but I would like to formally introduce Caleb Sai, who is on the board of directors for the National Youth Leadership Council and a student at Columbia University. Please, Caleb, welcome. And thank you for that very beautiful uh, introduction and very great panel discussion as well. Uh, so before I begin, uh, the most important word in the human language is thank you. Before I begin, I would like to thank my good friends at the National Museum and Center for Service, specifically the former congressman, for inviting me to speak today. I would also like to thank the DC Public Library for hosting us as well. As was mentioned before, my name is Caleb Sai. I am from the birthplace of rock and roll and southern soul, the home of the blues, and may I may add, the barbecue capital of the world, Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> I'm a sophomore pursuing a Bachelor's of Arts degree in economics and political science at Columbia University in New York City, go Lions. Now I understand that I am the one in between you all and lunch, so if you could just give me 15 minutes of your time, I'll, be make, I'll make sure that lunch is worthwhile. When people approach me, I'm often asked and I'm often reminded of what is service or how can I get involved? What is service is similar to the question of what does it mean to be an American? According to Merriam Webster, service is the act of helping others. If you look at the person to your left and if you look at the person to your right, they may have a different answer to these fundamental questions. But much of service is embedded in our national identity as Americans, because we accept these things as given truths. But I believe service is more than just merely helping people. It's about pushing society toward a higher moral standard, even when it's difficult or even when it's unpopular. We will expand on this definition as we move along. The connotation of service gives the allurement of success, wealth, and for 535 Americans, Congress, but these commonly held beliefs leave out one important thing, that's young people. Every revolution that America has undertaken throughout its history has been by young people in a quest for something greater than just personal satisfaction, but a rallying cry, a rallying cry for justice for all. Throughout history, young people did not know if their desired outcome would ever come true but the chance to disrupt the status quo far exceeded, it far exceeded just settling with it. On July 4th, 1776, James Monroe was 18 years old. Aaron Burr was 20 years old. Alexander Hamilton was 21. James Madison, 25. And Thomas Jefferson, 33. All of these young men have one thing in common. They're considered young by conventional standards. But these imperfect men felt the opportunity of freedom and self-determination expressed through their viewpoints and in their wavelength instead of by a ruler from thousands and hundreds of miles across an ocean. They famously put pen to paper to chart a new path and a radical approach to self-governance. Their mark for service was defined as service for survival. After enduring the bloody wars, they pressed on. In America, we love rights and freedoms. A right is a justified claim on others. As American history has shown us, tensions arise when we mention the word right. Fast forward to one right that we value strongly here in America, it's the right to vote. In the early 1900s, a young man named Harry Byrne 
changed the trajectory of voting in America. He is from my home state, Tennessee, and received this short note from his mom detailing her support for the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. One state was needed to ratify the amendment, and I'm glad that it was the great state of Tennessee, the volunteer state. The 19th Amendment barely passed our state Senate, and Representative Byrne was the one vote needed to pass the state house. He made history at the age of 22 to become the sole representative to say yes, women too have the right to vote, and anyone for that matter shall have the right to vote and shall not have that right be abridged on the basis of sex. Fast forward three decades later, we enter into the infamous civil rights movement where young people's advocacy is best described as service through strength. Groups like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, better known as SNCC, and the Congress of Racial Equality, better known as CORE, mobilized on college campuses to fight for the rights of people who have been denied equal protection for over a century. March 7th, 1965, was a painstaking and cumbersome day in American history. It was Bloody Sunday. At the age of 25, then student activist John Lewis led 600 protesters across the infamous Edmund Pettus Bridge, and then violence ensued. A 14-year-old girl by the name of Linda Lowry was beaten so badly that she needed seven stitches seven stitches above her right eye, and 28 stitches on the back of her head. And as for John, he suffered a skull fracture. It has scars on his head for 55 years into his passing in 2020. As John would say, he got in good trouble and had to pay the physical price for it. His definition of service was marked by struggle. With countless stitches, bruising, and lynchings, the young people of today are paving this way forward. History often reveres nonviolent protests, like Rosa Parks, who was just 42 years old when she sat at the front of a bus and refused to give her seat to a white woman. However, March 2nd, 1955, just seven days before my birthday, 50 years ago, I may add, was a consequential moment in history. On a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, there was a young black girl who sat beside a pregnant lady in the colored section when the bus driver requested that they move further back to make room for a white woman. This young 15-year-old black girl who did not meet quote-unquote society standards is Claudette Coven. And because of this, she is often left out of the conversation when discussing the history of the civil rights era. Now, some may say, did Coven have an impact even if some people may not know her story? Or even better yet, did she think about fame or recognition, even if it meant going to jail for it? Those are consequential and fundamental questions that I even still grapple with today. But I argue that her actions were an act of service, not because of Coven's actions led to a specific outcome, namely the desegregation of public busing, but because she did something that was inconvenient unconventional and something morally justified in her right as a human being. And fast forward to today, we see young people take to the streets and occupy their state houses to petition their government for a redress of grievances. Some say that revolution and protests are bad. However, I will beg to differ. I argue that we as a people and as a country have never made progress without it. Now to be clear, I'm not advocating for the violent overthrow of government because when that day comes, our democratic republic as we know it will cease to exist. Instead, I'm highlighting that protest with the intent, with the intent to bring awareness to injustice so policy change can be made. Applying pressures to our systems tests our core and fundamental principles as individuals and as a collective to see if we truly, if we truly believe in our freedoms, in times of crisis, or even when it's only convenient for us. America has survived the perils of the Civil War, two bloody world wars, a catastrophic 9-11, and a shameful domestic insurrection, but there is something much bigger at stake, democratic backsliding, or when the government stays, strays away from democratic ideals to implementing autocratic ideals. 
then you may wonder, does the status quo majority crowd out voices of dissent or silence them completely, even if they're young? Young people like Justin Pearson and Justin Jones protested in the well of the House floor back home in Tennessee to bring awareness to gun violence after the tragic event at the Covenant School shooting, despite political extremism trying to formulate a distorted view of what millions of people across the world saw with their own two eyes. Instead of getting censured, unfortunately, they made history as the two youngest black lawmakers to ever be expelled in my state's history. They advocated for an issue that did not happen in their districts and did not affect their electoral chances of winning their seats for re-election. But both Jones and Pearson did something worth living for, something worth dying for, and I will argue something worth being expelled for. They risked their seats, their safety, and their livelihood, all in the sentiment that our children should go to school to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic, and not hiding or praying that something bad won't happen. It doesn't matter which side of the issue you fall under. It does matter, however, that their struggle was born from service through struggle that defined the civil rights era, but I define their mark of service as something that was still and still is now in search of humanity. That search of humanity brought young people to the Tennessee State Capitol to advocate against gun violence shortly before their expulsion. That search for humanity brought young people on college campuses to vote in droves in 2008 to elect our first black president and in 2020 to usher in civility to government. That search for hum humanity has brought us here in 2024 where young people connect through the use of social media, the internet, and Zoom to bring awareness to injustices as they see them and voice their opinions. We saw a recent trend in America with 41% of young people aged 18 to 29 participating in a protest. And we saw an increase in youth participation during the pandemic in response to the brutal ki killings we witnessed then. Young People's Mark for Service has brought me to the Tennessee State Capitol numerous times since I was 12 years old. Here's me standing on the steps of the Capitol advocating against the privatization of our education system a year ago. In my speech, I reminded Tennesseans and even Tennesseans at heart that our public education system is not dead, but just like an iPhone or an Android or wherever you may have, it just needs an upgrade. With proper funding, accountability, and a curriculum that is both rigorous and easy to follow. If young people do not like talking too much, young people are starting nonprofits like Moe's Bowes. Moe's Bowes may sound familiar because he was on Shark Tank and made guest appearances on nationally syndicated television shows. His nonprofit was born because he thought that many soup stores back in my hometown of Memphis did not have a lot of bow ties that he liked and it did not fit his style. But I will say that bow ties definitely fit my style since I have one on today. He was able to grow his small business into a multinational business. It is no secret that Memphis has a crime problem, but in knowing that, he did not stop there. He created a scholarship program that gave 50 low-income students across my great city in Memphis a chance to be someone in life and go to a summer camp so they can stay off the dangerous streets of Memphis. Nonprofits like Girls Inc. do something the National Youth Leadership Council, better known as NYLC, the YMCA, as you've heard today, the ACLU, and Every Town for Gun Safety all have initiatives that teach young people how to critically think, how to critically think and not what to think. There is a difference. They teach young people how to disrupt the status quo by doing things that are unconventional and inconvenient while also bringing reasonable solutions and teach young people how to consider the minority whose voices are oftentimes crowded out by the majority. At the, new, at the National Youth Leadership Council, better known as NYLC, we have a youth advisory council that empowers young people to provide strategic feedback on the organization's programs while also empowering young nonprofits with guidance. This idea of protecting minorities is nothing new to America. 
And those are the principles that our founding fathers upheld, but we interpret it through a different perspective today than they simply did 250 years ago. According to a study, 2022 study from the Tufts University Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, the rate of 18 to 25 year olds running for political office has increased over the past 10 years and more than 20% of youth say that they would consider running for office. Groups like Run Gen Z and Running Start are mobilizing across the United States to encourage young people to run for political office and launch grassroots networks to have effective, effective campaigns which have been proven very effective. But young people do not have to run for office or launch nonprofits to be of service, as was mentioned earlier. They can peacefully use their voice in an informed, in an informed protest against problems and issues that they see in their community. Also, it is required of my generation, particularly Gen Z and Gen Alpha, to not merely protest, but to bring solutions to the conversation, because the commitment of young people throughout history and now has made the longing for those certain inalienable rights come true for all Americans. Those rights cannot come true without attainable solutions to complex problems. Let me repeat that again. Those rights cannot come true without attainable solutions to complex societal issues. The mark for service during the early republic was for survival. In the civil rights era, service was marked through strength. And I will argue service in search of humanity defines our current state of service in America. Now back to how I define service, since I said earlier that our definition of service did not go long enough. Service is the act of willingly helping others without seeking personal gain, driven by a yearning desire for society to reimagine how it protects people and their collective well-being during times when it is not politically or socially feasible and convenient. It involves embracing the uncertainty of the outcome, but not remaining content in it. Instead, persisting with the belief that yes, change is possible. Through challenging the status quo and questioning conventional practices, service applies pressure to those who hold distorted views of what equality looks like in order to advance equality for all, regardless of race, sex, gender, disability, religion, and age to move closer, to move America closer to the ideals of a more perfect union. Those are the stories worth telling, and young people have shaken things up in society by not waiting for convenience, but striving towards a sense of belonging, where poor children have access to an education where they can go from the riddled housing projects of America's inner cities to become the first person in their family to go to college, where people don't just look at themselves as merely Democrats and Republicans and independents, but as we, the people. Where a poor grandmother in the American South can say, yes, although I am poor, I have a right to health care. And where children can go to school to learn and not hide, and where the disabled can say that, yes, I am too, am a human. American has gotten it wrong and has gotten it right in some regards. But throughout history, young people have always been there not to compromise because it was feasible, but to invoke radical change different from the status quo. That is the America that I've known throughout history and will be the same America that will bring us here in the next 250 years. Thank you.